Aaron Robbins here with the Magic of Voxel slash Unity slash Playmaker slash C Sharp demonstration. Today we're going to talk about texture swapping or how to use the same model um, from Magic of Voxel but apply different textures to it uh, in your game or project. So we just have a ray gun here model that I made in Magic of Voxel. Nothing special about that. It's already been colored. First thing we want to do is just get this model into Unity, which is not complicated at all. We're just going to go up to File and select Export. And it would help if we were in the Magic of Voxel menu. Export. And we want the OBJ, or the object file. And then we want to be in our Unity project. So you can see here I'm in the AR Texture Swap demo project. You definitely want to be inside your Assets folder. Might be a little more easy if I uh, do it this way. You can see I already have Playmaker. You won't see any of this stuff if it's just a clean uh, project for you, but I have the Playmaker plugin installed. And so inside the Assets folder, I, the only thing I did here was create a folder called Models. This doesn't uh, appear by default with a brand new Unity project, so you can just create a folder called Models. I'm going to go in there. I just like to store mine in there, and I'm going to save, save this as the uh, raygun.object. And Magic of Voxel is also going to put into that folder um, this color palette as a .png file. And it's also going to put in there a material file, file which is going to help Unity link that PNG to the default material for that. I'm going to show you that a little. Don't get scared. It's not a big deal. I'm going to show it to you in just a second. So now that we have our red gun saved in, in there, we want to create a different colored version of this gun. We don't want a different model. We just want a different colored version of that. And it's really as simple as just going up to your palette and starting to recolor the gun to something else that you like. So we'll do that for there, and then we'll maybe make that sort of a yellowish color, um, like that, and then change the emblem to red. Now here's the only thing that you need to be aware of um, in Magic of Voxel, is I can just swap colors, okay? I can't add new colors, I can't use the paint tool and start painting around new things and say like, oh, but for this other version of the gun I want you know, two white stripes here, and things like that. You can only swap the colors, and that is because the UVs, um, that is where the colors are mapped to this model, are set already according to the, this palette setup. So if I start creating new colors, if I start adding geometry, or if I even start painting on the model, I've messed up the U not messed up the UVs, I've changed the UV layout, if you will, and so that would require an actual new model or some other kind of setup in Unity. So in this case, the only thing that you can do is swap these kind of now fixed color positions. There are tricks to that, like if you know that you want to have two stripes here on one model and um, only one on another model, you could just create another um, color palette and color the, the you know hide the stripe basically. You would color it gray so it was hidden here, and then on your other model where you wanted that stripe to appear, you would you know bring the color up from gray to something else. So you can do that, but you cannot just start painting new stuff and still use the same model. You would have to do something else. All right. So now that we have that, we don't need to resave our model because I just took you know like a lot of your time explaining about kind of how the UVs work and stuff like that, and so we don't need to save the model out. That's the whole point of this is to use the same model. All we need is the PNG. So we do that uh, underneath the color palette by hitting save, and you can tell it's going to just give me a PNG, which I want, but it's going to overwrite that red one that was automatically exported um, when I exported the object file. So I'm going to actually just call this ray gun blue. And we're good enough for there. Let's do one more and we'll do like a ray gun blue epic. So like when the gun's really cool, um, the blue gets uh, lighter and the yellow gets uh, like red. I don't know. I have no idea. This isn't a real game. And turn the emblem part yellow. And we'll change that to something that lets the player know that this is the best ray gun in the entire game. Definitely. Okay, that's the worst looking candy looking gun ever. But there you go. There, okay. So then we're gonna go ahead, and again, we don't need to save the model, just the palette. So we're gonna save one more here, and we'll call this Ray Gun Blue uh, Epic. And so we have two color palettes for our, our bluish, purplish, whatever color this is. I'm colorblind gun. Um, but we only had one for the red gun. And you're saying, well, why are you doing four? Why do you have two guns? And that is because I'm going to do one with Playmaker and one with C-Sharp, and we're going to run those right next to each other. But instead of just recoloring the red gun into the epic version in Magic of Voxel, we're going to do that in Photoshop just to show you a, an alternate way to do that. So I'll go ahead and open up Photoshop here, and the only thing that I need to actually do is go ahead and open 
I'm inside my models folder. So I'm inside my Unity project, inside the assets folder, inside the models folder, and I'm just looking for that original red gun palette, which is right here. And you'll see it is a 256 wide by one pixel high um, image. And you can see all the colors that are mapped to the UVs, if you will, on the model. So there's like the red part of the gun, there's the emblem, and all that stuff. So the only thing that I need to do uh, to create an epic version of this gun when the beach ball goes away um, would be if I just wanted to create a random color, I could just go ahead and head into the hue saturation thing and start changing the colors, and that would work just fine. In fact, um, let's just do that. So we'll just go ahead with that. Actually, let's go back to zero and not change the... Uh, we're gonna try not to change the color exactly to the blue one so that it's funner to look at. So we will change that so that that red turns into something that, there you go, that's not blue so that we don't confuse it with the other thing, the other gun. And then we're just gonna go ahead and export this as a PNG right into our assets folder. Um, and we're gonna call this red, ray gun, red, epic, even though it's not red anymore, that's okay. Now we've done everything we need to do our two different uh, texture swapping things. We're done with Magic of Voxel, and we're done with Photoshop. At this point in time, we're gonna stick into Unity. I don't know what that means, stick into Unity, but we're gonna go into Unity and stay there. This is what I meant to say. Okay, so there we go, we're in Unity. That little import thing, I didn't initiate that. Unity was scanning the folders in the assets folder and found some new stuff in there and it brought it in for me. And let's take a look at what it brought in. First, it brought in my Raygun model, which is when I did the export command in Magic of Voxel. It used this little material thing that it brought in to connect uh, this default material, this palette material, to the gun. And um, it brought in all four images. Of course, it brought in the one when I did the export of the object. It brought that one in when I saved it. It saved the palette from Magic of Voxel, that one as well, and that one came in from Photoshop. Um, but they're all the same thing. All their properties up here are fine. You could mess around with them and uh, set it to clamp and set the uh, filter to point and whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter um, for this particular example. Okay, so uh, we're just going to go ahead and revert because we don't need to do that. So first we're going to do is just put our model in, in the scene. And you're going to see it is rather large and, uh, and in charge, to be honest with you. It's pretty big. So what we want to do is we could bring our camera out and make everything in our scene adjust to the size of the model that was brought in, or we can adjust the model to the size of our scene. And I'm going to do that. So I'll select the model in my uh, assets here, and the scale factor on the model tab here, I'll set that to point uh, 1 and see how that looks. Also make sure that it is uh, centered. It's transforms all centered there. It is still way too big. Um, so we'll go ahead and set this to... 0.05 and hit apply and that looks a little bit better to me and then we're going to bring this guy over here and we will uh, rotate him so that we can see better. Alright, so that's Raygun 1 and we'll probably control that one with Playmaker. The next thing we need to do is bring in Raygun 2. First, we need to some, do some material work, so we're going to have two different materials. So we'll call this one Red Mat, and Unity is going to have no trouble uh, finding that I just renamed that uh, material uh, here. You can see it updated the name here as Red Mat as well, and now it's highlighting it, showing me that. But I also need another version of this, so I just went ahead and hit uh, Control D, or however you want to duplicate the texture in um, Unity, and I'll call this one Blue Mat. And that one is good, except for that it has the wrong uh, texture applied to it. You can see that if I zoom in here and apply the blue mat to this gun, nothing happens because um, it has the exact same material on it. We'll change that right now by selecting the blue material in my assets. And then we want this albedo, albedo, however you say that, I'm here. And we can click on the little target, and we will select all these fun Playmaker uh, stuff here. You can also drag them from the assets folder, but we'll go ahead and select ray gun blue. And you can see now the ray gun has turned blue in the thing, um, which is good. That's the right texture for this particular material, but this is the red gun. Um, so we're going to go ahead and put that one back on there, and we'll rename this uh, red ray gun. And we'll go ahead, the default mesh that's underneath it, you can see this has all the fun stuff on it. The mesh render, this is just kind of a wrapper or a parent. All it has is a transform. Um, the default thing underneath it, which you can also see in the project folder and models, you can see our ray gun, that's kind of the wrapper, and then all the fun mesh stuff 
that you like is actually underneath that. And so we're going to rename that to something more useful than just default. We'll name it Raygun Red Mesh because it has the mesh renderer um, and our material on it, which is what we actually care about. Okay, so that was a lot. Sticking with me, you're doing fantastic if you are, but we need another ray gun. So we're just going to put another one in the scene, and we are going to uh, not move it that direction, but we will also rotate it, uh, this time negative 90 degrees, and that way. Set its transform to 000, and then move it over so that it's pointing at the other ray gun, and you can probably guess we're going to name this one blue ray gun and underneath it we are going to name uh, its mesh from default to blue ray gun mesh. No big deal there, exactly the same, except for there's one problem, our blue ray gun mesh is still using the red mat. Super easy to take care of, we'll just go ahead and drag uh, the blue one on top of it. I think I just put that on the wrong one. Okay, so now we have, let's make sure, we have our red ray gun as red, our blue ray gun is blue, and we are ready to start doing texture swapping. All of that just to get to uh, be able to swap some textures on an object. All right, so we're gonna open up the Playmaker Editor. I'm gonna assume you know how to install and get Playmaker running, and I'm going to, for now, dock that as another window um, over here. I actually want it over here. All right, so I'm gonna dock that as another window kind of over here. It doesn't really matter how your Unity uh, windows are set up. Just do whatever you're comfortable with, doesn't matter. And so the first thing that I need to do is we're going to make our red one our Playmaker one. And I am going to, I don't want to put the, the, the FSM or the, uh, the state machine on the red ray gun parent. I'm going to go ahead and put it on the mesh because I need the mesh's properties. Most importantly, I need this red material. And it's just easier if I put the FSM or the state machine on where the thing is that I want. There are definitely ways, you know, especially in Playmaker, to get at the object you want, but I'm gonna start with the object I want. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and click Add FSM. And so when the scene loads up, it's gonna come in through, start here to this first state, and this, uh, first let's name our FSM to Texture Swapper. That's good enough. And then state one, we'll call that just boring. That's the boring gun. Boring gun. Yeah, boring gun's fine. And we need another state, and we're going to call that state epic gun. The, the names don't really have any really a technical purpose, if you will. I mean, they kind of do, but for right now, I'm just naming them so I know what state. This is boring gun, and this is epic gun. And so when we're on boring gun, we want to set the texture just to that plain red texture. And uh, so we'll do the action browser down here. And... You can just search for these in Playmaker. They make it super easy to find stuff. And we are looking for the set texture, uh, set ma set material texture right here, this guy right here. So we're gonna go ahead and add that to that. And the game object we wanna use is the owner because we attached this FSM to the mesh that we wanted and not something else that didn't have the mesh. Um, so we're good there, material index and the material uh, and all that stuff you don't have to worry about. The only thing that we're going to do is add a new texture in here. So we'll hit select and we get to find, um, because of all this other stuff, we get to find the red ray gun epic, which is right there. So we're good there. So that's going to change it to the red ray gun epic, which you're saying that's not what you want. You want it on boring gun. You don't want the epic texture. And I'd say good catch, man. Really good watching the video and paying attention to what's going on. So let's go back to select the right texture, which is just the default ray gun texture, the boring one. Okay. On epic gun, though, when we do action browser, I just switched over to the epic gun state, and I'm going to go ahead and select set material texture, same as I just did on the boring state. Uh, but this time, now we get to use the epic texture, which is fantastic. So there we get to select the red ray gun, the ray gun red epic texture. So this state, boring gun, has that one. This state uh, has the fun one. And now we just need to transition between the two. And we're just going to do that with time. We're just going to, after a certain amount of time, we could do it with a mouse click or some other condition that the user um, invokes or, or has happened to them. But we're just going to do it with time. And so I can go ahead and use the action browser. And I can go ahead and get some time stuff. Um, and they just say get time info in Playmaker, and this is sort of a generic name for lots of different time stuff that you could get if you wanted. 
And when I look at get time info, you can see I can get a bunch of different types of time. I can get time since level loaded. I can get delta time, which what is what we're going to do in C sharp. Um, I can get time in current state. And so that's what I'm going to do, get the time in the current state, because that will count how long I've been on the boring gun and how long I've been in the epic gun. We're definitely going to need to store that value, the value of the time somewhere, because I'm going to check it later to see uh, what it is. So we'll need a new variable, and we're going to call that uh, variable just time in state var. That'll be good. And we will update that every frame. So now the game's going to start. It's going to come into this boring gun state. It's going to set the texture to just the standard red ray gun texture. It's going to get the current time that we've been in that state, and it's going to store that information, which is going to be a floating point decimal, in the variable time in state variable, which is just a container. It's just a package that's going to hold um, the sort of time that we've been in the current state in a named container, and that container I named time in state var. Okay, that's all that's happening so far. It's not exciting. Now, to make something exciting happen, we're going to need to use a conditional expression, or I'm going to choose to use a conditional expression. You do whatever you want to do. Um, so I added a conditional expression. Um, it added it to the top. I'm going to go ahead and just move it to the bottom. I like to have them in the order that they're sort of happening. And it wants to know what the expression is I want to write. So I want to know if our variable or our container or our named package that's holding the amount of time we've been in the current state, I want to know if that, which you can see I typed that name right here, and if you also get confused you can click over on the variable tab and see not only how many FSMs are using it right here, but what the name was. But we're going to go back to this, and I love that in Playmaker it actually tells you that variable TI was not found. They're like, this variable you're trying to check doesn't actually exist, and that's because I'm not done typing it. But I know I named mine time in state var. And again, I got that from here and from on the variables tab and because I just typed it 10 seconds ago. And I want to say if it's greater than like two-ish, then I'm going to do something else. And what I'm going to do is make a transition. If it's true, if the time that I've been in this current state is greater than two, I'm going to make a transition. And so I click this little uh, drop down here and none of these events are what I'm interested in. I want a new one. It says, what do you want this event uh, to be, and I'm going to call it go to epic, and then create the event. And then it's giving me another error saying that you haven't used this, and it's like, well, I know that. I just created it. I haven't had a chance to use it, man. Give me a break. So I'll add a transition called go to epic, and then that appears below, and now I can drag that over to here. So what's happening now? What's happening now is the game loads, comes through start, sets the texture to red, um, and then it's continually checking to see if my time that I've been in this current state is greater than two. And if it has been, or if that event is true, it's going to use the go to epic event to transfer over to epic gun two. That's all that's going on so far. Only other thing I'd like to point out, that typing in a numerical value here is not the best idea in the world because then you get to go back and whenever you want to change that value, like, oh, two seconds is too quick or too long. You get to go to all the different places you've typed that in, change it. Not a great idea. So instead, what let's do, let's go to the variables tab. We'll create a new variable called uh, cycle time. And that will be great. And we'll go ahead and hit add. And we'll set the cycle time to 2. So instead of just typing 2 as a, in our conditional expression, we'll create another little named container and named package here called cycle time. And we're going to store in that little thing uh, the value of 2. So now we can go back to our FSM. And in our conditional uh, statement here, instead of time in state var is greater than 2, I can say it's greater than cycle Time. And again, Playmaker is being very helpful in telling me variable not found cycle because I haven't finished typing it and the I is not capitalized. And now we're good. So time in the state greater than this cycle time thing that I created over here. And you can always check the value of cycle time by going to the variables tab, looking at cycle and seeing that, yep, it's set to two and I could change it for wherever. And then wherever I use cycle time, it would update. Okay, so we have all of that set up. All we're going to do now is make sure that it goes over to the Epic Gun. So we're just going to press start. It'll come down here and turn yellow, and then it should go over to Epic Gun. So let's do that now. And cool, it didn't do that. So that's awesome. So let's go ahead and figure out why it didn't do that. Oh, because we're not checking it on every frame. So the reason why it did that is it checked it at the very first frame when it came in, and then it never checked it again. I promise it's going to work this time. Stuff's like, you know, reliable. Okay, so that worked. Everybody happy? Great. Came in at start, 
waited, went over. Groovy? Okay. So now we want it to go back, though. So what we're going to do to get it to go back, it's not uh, hugely complicated. We're just going to go ahead and create another action um, that is a conditional expression. But actually, we need to get the uh, um, time first. So time, and we want to get, get time info. And I also know we need a conditional expression. So if you just forgive me, I'm going to add it right now instead of coming back here. Um, so there you go. So we added the two actions, just the same ones we had over there. Not a big deal. So the conditional expression, again, I like to have that at the bottom because I'm neurotic or something, not really sure. But we want, again, not time since level loaded. We want time in current state, just like the first one. Where do you want to store that value? We're going to actually store it in the exact same container that we used before, time and state variable. There's no reason to create a new one because this is really just serving as a counter at this point in time. And we're going to say same thing as before. If time in state var is greater than the cycle time bar, which again right now is set to two cycle time. The only thing that difference here is if this is true, we're going to head back to boring. So we don't we can't use go to epic because that sends us over to the epic gun. We need to go to something else, and so we need a new event. We're going to call that one go to boring create event. And I know it's saying, you're not using go to boring. And I'm like, I'm going to use it right now, I promise. And so we'll send that one back to there. And if everything is well, those things should go ahead and flash back and forth for us. I don't think I selected the every frame thing again. There we go. All right, let's check it out now. Okay, so once again, I keep forgetting to check every frame, and now that should work, no problem. And it's going back. So now if we just wanted to make that happen a lot faster, we could go over to our variables tab, time and state, and instead of, sorry, cycle time, instead of making the cycle time 0.2, we could make it like 0.7. And the gun should kind of be flashy at this point in time. Great, it's a traffic light or something like that. I don't know. Last thing we're going to do just for fun is make this gun rotate so that we can kind of get a better view of it. And we could do that right here in this FSM or this state machine, but then I would have to add the rotation to both the epic gun state and the boring gun state, and I don't want to duplicate that. So what I'm going to do is just add another quick FSM. So I'll just go up here and say add FSM. It's just going to add another one. If you get lost in where your FSMs are, they're always, you know, under this little drop down here, but also you can select the object and see them uh, in the inspector here. So here is my texture swapper and here is an FSM I haven't named yet. And so let's take care of that. Just go ahead and name this one uh, rotate. Very good. And it's just going to have one state. We're going to call that rotating because that's the best description ever. Rotating. And we need an action. And... Um, so that's probably rotate, I'm guessing. And that looks pretty good to me. Rotates a game object around an axis. Sounds good. Let's use that. And so we're going to go ahead and close out of that. And the game object we want to use is the one it's attached to. Uh, we don't want it to rotate in all of the uh, components, the parts of a vector, just the up axis. Um, and we will give this one a value of, say, 15. So that means it's going to rotate 15. Um, according to its own space, which is good. So that, uh, the space that is for the model, not for the world. I assume you can check that there, yep. Um, and we want it to do it every second, and again, every frame. Um, and this is where they want the rotate to happen. There's actually um, like three update functions that Unity uses. There might be more. There is just the standard update, the fixed update, the late update. Um, those have to do with frame rate and physics and how often the update is called, whether it's consistent or whether or not it's adjusted. But you don't need to worry about that right now. We're just going to leave it as it is and make sure that works. So we'll hit play, and our little uh, thing should turn yellow here, and the gun should start rotating, which it is ridiculously slow, but it is. Um, so we'll go ahead and increase that to 30. I shouldn't test it, but I'm going to. Okay. So now we're ready to do the same thing in C sharp. And um, so we're done with Playmaker. Everybody's cool with that because I'm going to get rid of it. Um, not like totally, but I don't want this window. Um, sorry. I don't want this window here anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and say close tab. And so now we're just going to be here. So I'm going to go ahead and select my blue gun now. 
And in my assets folder, I'm just gonna create a new really quick folder. You don't have to do this, but let's be tidy. I'm gonna call that scripts and I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna go ahead and create a new C sharp script and I'm just gonna call this one uh, Raygun. And then I'm gonna double click on the script uh, to edit it. If I do that though, I'm going to forget to apply it to the, the blue ray gun later. So let's just go ahead and do that now. Um, so just like with the, the FSM or the state machine, I'm gonna actually apply the script to the mesh, not the wrapper, because that's where all of our stuff is that we want, the blue material and all that stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and just drag that over so I don't forget to do it um, later. And so you can see my ray gun script is on there right now, but it does nothing. Now we can go ahead and just double click on it. Okay, MonoDevelop has loaded, and you can see it kind of gave us a template for a Unity C Sharp script. It uh, imported the Unity engine stuff and the system collection stuff, which is uh, what you get by default. Um, and then start this method, or whatever instructions we give between here, is called um, when the model is loaded. Um, there's a couple other ones that are called before it that you don't see here, like on awake, on enable, um, and all that kind of stuff like that. But you just need start and update for now. It's a super simple example. So in Playmaker, you remember uh, that we, we added the little rotate action to it and we gave it a value of 15. Well, in Playmaker, I don't have to worry about where I'm storing that. I'm just typing it into the FSM. But in when I'm scripting in C Sharp, uh, I need a place to actually store that value so I can change it easily. So I'm going to make a public float and I'm going to call that rotation. I'm going to spell it right too, rotation speed. Okay, so it's no big deal, nothing complicated here, just sort of a named container that's gonna hold a floating point decimal and I put the word public here so that it gets exposed um, to me in the Unity editor. There's a couple other reasons why what public does, but we're not gonna get into those right now, but just know for now, that means I can edit it in the editor. It's not just sort of um, hidden, if you will, in this particular um, instantiation of the class. I shouldn't have said that last part. Let's keep going. The other thing we're gonna need is a public uh, float, just another one, just another floating point now, and this is the cycle time. And remember, we created this in Playmaker as well. This is how long it's in each state, uh, boring or epic. Um, in Playmaker, I think we, we changed that value. We started with two and changed it down to one. Um, so we need that, and we need a couple more. Um, we need a private float called state time. You can call these whatever you want. I'm just naming them state time. This is private, meaning I don't want to be able to edit this in the editor. I'm not, this isn't something that a designer that I'm gonna change a bunch. This is something I'm using to keep track of. So I just wanna use it inside of this class. Um, I don't want it exposed in the editor. It's a floating point decimal, I'm calling it state time. And what this is gonna do, is it's gonna hold how long we've been in the state. We need a place to hold that information. In Playmaker, it kind of gets done automatically for you. Playmaker keeps track of that and sort of stores it internally. Um, or I think I was storing it in time and state var or something like that. Yeah, I was, I was storing it in a variable in Playmaker called time and state. This is that, it's that variable. I should have named them the same, that would have been awesome. Okay, so we need another one here and we are going to create a Boolean, a bool, B-O-O-L, private. Again, I don't want anybody to mess with it in the editor. I don't need to see its value. I just need to track it here in the script. And this is going to be called is night, which is just is night. It's going to be called is epic. So is epic is going to be keeping track of something very special, which is if the model or if the textures, texture is currently in epic or not. That's really all the purpose it serves, just to keep track of whether or not it's epic or not. We only need two more. I know this is a lot, but we only need two more. And they're going to be two textures. So these are not floating point decimals that we're trying to store in this container, in this package. We're not trying to shove a float in there or a bool. We're actually trying to store a texture in there. And we're going to call this one boring text. And we're going to call the next one epic text. And there is no such... Uh, class or thing as a texture, it's texture. So we want to be able to set these in the editor. Um, they are of type texture. These are Unity textures we want to store and we're going to put one in a container called boring text and the other one in a container called epic text. We don't actually need to do anything in the, uh, in the start function, but in the update function, we're going to do a couple of things. So I'm going to go ahead and type a comment in here uh, that this is the area of the update that we're going to do the rotating in. And I happen to know that on the transform object, 
or on this, the, that the transform, this guy right here, when I select anything and I look at this little transform thing, that this has a method or a function or a set of instructions called rotate that will allow me to actually set those values. So to access that, um, just understand in Unity that everything starts off as a game object. And then every game object has a transform, as you saw right here. This is a game object. Game object has a transform. This is a wrapper of a game. Ob uh, this is a wrapper of a model, and that also has a transform. It also happens to be a game object. So all things are game objects. All game objects have transforms, and I happen to know that the transform has a method or a function or a set of instructions or directions, whatever you want to call it, called rotate. And so there it is right there. It gives me a little summary of what it does. So you can see this is the name of the method, the function, the instructions. This is uh, what it takes, or these are the arguments that it takes, or this is the input that it's expecting when you call that function. And so we're going to actually do that right now. So we'll say we want to rotate. And it says, okay, now give me how much you want to rotate. So I want to give it vector 3, which is an x, y, and z. Uh, vector 3 is a like a structure that holds an x, uh, y, and z set of floating point decimals. Um, but I'm going to take a shortcut and give it vector 3 up. What that means is basically whichever way y is pointing. Um, so that means if I, if I were to rotate this ray gun and y were no longer pointing uh, up, it would still figure out um, which direction y was pointing and rotate around that, more or less. So I'll give it vector 3 up, <clears throat> which I think technically, not that you need to know this, is, would be a value of 0 for x, 1 for y, and 0 for z. Um, and that's not going to do anything exciting. Um, for us, and it's just going to it's just going to set it at that position over and over and over again. That's not exciting at all. Well, to actually make it rotate, we're going to need to times that vector three by something. We're going to need to get the value to change over time, or else it won't rotate. So what we'll do is we're going to times it by that rotation speed that we set uh, earlier. So that will give us a value greater than one first of all. Again, vector three up is just a shortcut way of saying it's zero in x, it's one in whatever direction y is pointing, and zero in z. And again, that's not helpful because rotating at one doesn't show us anything. So we're going to amplify it or mag you know, magnify that by timesing at times our rotation speed. Um, and then, remember because like zero times a number is zero, but one times a number is actually going to give us this thing back. But that's just going to rotate it, you know, amplify it. It's just going to actually rotate. If we set rotation speed to 15, it's going to set it to 15. It's not going to, like, keep doing it 15 over and over and over again. To do that, we need to actually times the rotation speed times time. <clears throat> so we will do uh, the time class, and we'll get the time. Uh, actually, let's get the delta time, which is the time since the last frame. And that will give us a little incremental bump on the rotation speed every single frame. Um, and I think we need two of those, and we're actually done. That was actually way too much explanation on something as simple as rotating, but there you go. Find our game, the, this particular game object, get its transform, uh, and then call the rotate method that transform has and pass in this information. Actually, in Unity, the, the game object is assumed, so you don't have to actually type in game object. You can just do transform. Either works. You don't have to worry about that. All right. So we're going to get into the next part. Uh, let's test this out really quickly so we can put this one uh, to bed. The first thing we want to know is that we don't get any errors. Looks good down here. We don't see any warning signs. Let's make sure that our blue gun uh, actually has that on it. I remember I did that because I thought I would forget. And we should have some problems here. And the first problem is that I didn't actually set any values on my script. Remember, we made those variables public, so we need to enter some information. So the rotation speed we'll put in as 30, and the cycle time we'll set as 2 for right now, even though we're not using it. The boring texture, we have not set those to. Let's just do those now, because we're here. Um, so we need to go ahead and go into our models folder, and we're going to go ahead and find our boring texture for our blue gun, which is just ray gun blue. We'll drop that in there. Uh, we'll drop that in there. And then we're going to find our ray gun blue epic. Again, these are just PNGs. These are just those 256 pixel by one pixel high PNGs that we got out of Magic of Voxel or Photoshop. We just dropped one in boring and one in epic, set our cycle time, that's all we did. Those all corresponded to those public variables that we set at the top of the script, but we're going to hit play now, make sure our rotation's going so that we won't have to talk about that ever again. And that's working just great. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish up our script, and then we'll be done with this tutorial, and you guys can go outside and play, which will be great. Next thing we need to do in update is uh, go ahead and check for what texture is going on. So the first thing, let's do this actually. Let's get the state time, because this is gonna, the update function runs 
um, all the time. It's called constantly. Once per frame, says Unity, which is probably right because Unity said it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take the state time, which right now is at zero, and we'll take its current value and add it to the time, time delta. We just used this thing before. And what this does <clears throat> is the very first time that update runs, the state time is set to nothing. It's set to zero. So this plus equals means take the value that's already stored and add something to it. If it were just like this, it would mean replace whatever value is here with the time, time, de the delta time. But we don't want to replace the value, we want to keep adding to it so we can keep track of how long we've been in this state. So state time, take my own value and add something to it, and that is the time since last frame. It's very similar to what we did here, is we're just incrementing time um, over and over and over again. We're keeping track of how much time <clears throat> has taken place. And you would say, well, can't you actually just do that with the time, time function? Doesn't that keep track of how much time since the game started? And I would say, yes, you're right, but I can't reset um, that value. That's why I'm storing it in a variable that I can reset. Um, and I want the time that it's changed, not the total time that the game has elapsed. I just want the incremental amount of time that has changed since this update function was last called. Okay, so that's why we do state time. It's a way of us keeping track of how long we've been um, doing something. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, if the state time is greater than our cycle time. This should look very similar to what we did in Playmaker where we compared those two variables together. If it's greater, <clears throat> the first thing I want to do is set the state time back to zero because this is really just a counter. So I'm going to set this back to zero so that it no longer evaluates as true. If I didn't set it back to zero, it would evaluate as true and just keep going and never evaluate and never check it again. So I need to set it back to zero. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see if we are in is night. So if night, the boolean that we set right, uh, why do I keep saying is night? Oh, because I did a different tutorial with it. Sorry. Is epic. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is check to see if is epic. I keep saying first thing. It was like the millionth thing we've done. Is set to true. It comes in and it's set as false because we didn't set it to true. We could explicitly set it to true at the start by doing that, but we're not going to do that. We'll leave it as false. False. And I'm going to say, if is epic, meaning the, the ray gun currently is in its epic state, then is epic is no longer um, true. We're going to cycle it down to false. Why? Well, the, the reason is, it is currently epic, which means in this state, the epic set texture will be set. I know we haven't done that yet, but just trust me, it will be set when it's in the is epic state. So if it is epic, we don't want it to be epic anymore. We want it to go back to being boring. So we're going to set is epic equal to false now so that we're not in that state anymore. And the next thing we would do after that is um, call a method that sets the texture <clears throat> to, um, we'll call, what did we call this? Boring texture. Why not epic texture? Why are we setting it to boring texture? It's not boring text, it's boring texture. We're setting the texture to boring texture because we're currently in epic. So epic texture is what's currently set right now when this is evaluating to true. Yep, it's epic. So the first thing we're doing is saying, okay, well then we're not in epic anymore and now we're going to set it to boring texture to match the fact that we're not in epic anymore. And the else command, or the else part of this, if we're not in epic, meaning if is epic evaluates to false, then we must be in boring. So let's go ahead and say, yeah, let's go ahead and be in epic now. And we're going to go ahead and set the texture um, to the epic texture. Why not boring? Why not the boring texture? Because we are in boring. Is epic is false, which means we're in boring. So the current texture is uh, epic. So we'll say, yep, we're going to go to epic now and set the texture to epic. It's just a flip-flop. It's just a toggle. <clears throat> the next most important question is, why is set texture in red? I've never heard of that before. That's because there is no such thing as set, set texture. Set texture is a uh, set of directions, a function, a method that I'm planning on creating with you guys right now. So let's actually do that. So we don't want to be inside the update because this is its own method or set of instructions or function or whatever you call it. We're going to create a new one. We type void because this isn't returning anything. If at the end of this instructions we got a float, we would type float. If at the end of this instructions we got a bool, we would type bool. If at the end of this instructions somebody delivered us a pizza, we would type pizza. But we're not getting anything back, so we type void. And we'll call this set texture because that's what I decided to name it. And you can see inside of here I took one argument. And the argument is the texture that I want to actually set, or the texture I want to set on the model. 
Um, so what I do to do that is I say the argument that I want is of type texture, and I'll just call it, uh, we'll call it new texture just so we're clear on what we're doing here. Should have called it texture to set or something like that. So all of here is said, I'm going to give you a set of instructions, Unity. Don't expect anything back at the end of these instructions. They just do something. They don't produce anything. I'm going to call it set texture, and every time I call set texture or I call these, these directions, these functions, these methods, these things into being, every time I call them, you can expect to receive a named container with them of type texture, meaning that little container I promise will carry a texture with it. And since we're passing these guys in right here and they are of type texture, they will fit nicely into this method when we call them right here. Okay, so now we have a set of instructions, a function, a method, or whatever you want to call it that takes a texture uh, as an argument, but it doesn't do anything right now. So what we need to do is find out how do we get the uh, how do we get a material and change the texture on it. What we're trying to just do is get this little ray gun right here, this guy right here. It's actually I think the blue one. Which one are we doing? The red one. Uh, nope, the blue one. What we're trying to actually do is get this component, uh, right, and change a value on this material right here. We're trying to change this. How do I know that? Well, this is where the material is stored, so I know that I'm on the game object, uh, and then the mesh renderer of that game object, and then the material of that game object. And how do I know that's where the texture stores? When I click on it, it highlights in yellow here, and if I select it, I select this texture, I know that this is where my texture is right here. So that's kind of the path to where this thing is stored, is it's on a game object, it's in a mesh renderer, and um, it's on this material, red material, and then on the red material, it is in this uh, Elbedo thing right there. Cool? Great. So now let's do that in code. And to do that, <clears throat> I don't grab the mesh renderer. All I need to actually do is grab the renderer component. And I'm going to call it renderer. And then I just need to get it. So all I did right here is create a named container, a variable. I said, I'm, I, I'm going to create a, a, uh, a container. And inside that, I'm going to store a renderer. And I'm going to call that container renderer, just with the lowercase. But I don't actually have anything in there right now. It's not like just by typing that in, Unity went and got the thing and, and got the game object's renderer and put it on there. I have to do that through code. Luckily in Unity, it's pretty easy. I can just go game object, get component. Don't be scared of the little less than or uh, greater than signs here. What it means is that get component uh, takes a generic type of uh, entity of argument and we get to fill in what type of component we would like it to go get and uh, we want it to go get the renderer. I'll tell you why in a second, although you can probably figure it out and that is actually a method so that's why it gets the little curly braces right there. So get component is, is a method like anything else that looks like that. Get component doesn't take any arguments, right? But because get component can get a whole bunch of different types of components, it could get the, uh, you know, a rigid body, it could get a collider, it could get um, a trail renderer, it could get um, whatever. <clears throat> it takes a generic. And to tell it what it should go get, we put in the less than and equals than, and then we tell it what it should go get. So it's going to go get the renderer. Why is it getting the renderer? Because that's exactly what we're storing in our container. We said, here's a container that has a rend that's going to store a renderer. We're going to call it renderer with a lowercase. Now go out and get that renderer for me. And so that's what it did. And I think the game object part is actually unnecessary as well. So we'll just do that. So now we have a container inside of our code that has that renderer. What renderer does it have? Well, it, has, it has whatever renderer that script is attached to. In our case, the script is attached to this game object, so it's going to go get this mesh renderer right here. I'm over explaining all of this, but you know, whatever. So now we can do something with that. And what we can do is we can say that the renderer, that's our lowercase, this is our named container right here, that that thing that you put in there, we're going to want to access its material. And the material you want to access has a main texture. And we want to actually set that texture equal to whatever was just passed to us. Okay, so we pass in boring texture, that kind of takes the place here of new texture, boring texture becomes new texture, and then it gets assigned to the material. When we pass in epic texture, epic texture comes in through here, it becomes new texture, and new texture gets assigned to the material. I wish there were more, but that's really it. Um, are we doing everything? Feels like we're doing everything. I say we just go for it. When in doubt, just hit play and see what happens. 
So there you have it, both guns rotating and swapping back and forth between their epic textures and their normal boring textures, uh, and how to do that in C-sharp and Playmaker. Hope you enjoyed, I know it was super duper long, but I had fun doing it, I like this sort of thing. Thanks for watching, subscribe to the channel if you're interested in this sort of thing. More Unity tutorials, more Magic of Voxel tutorials coming soon, thanks guys.